Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today, the top 10 infamous American assassins who are still alive. Assassination is so ingrained in American culture that it's practically a national pastime. Every single president since Lyndon Johnson has been the target of an assassination attempt, with plenty more before LBJ also finding themselves on the wrong end of a bullet. And that's before you even take into account the lower-ranking politicians that have been attacked, as well as the civil rights figures, the sportsmen, the artists. All we are saying is that if assassination was an Olympic sport, Team USA would be beating everyone but Russia. The one upside is that American assassinations usually end up with the assassin themselves dying. Think of Lee Harvey Oswald gunned down by Jack Ruby or John Wilkes Booth shot to pieces by federal troops. But usually isn't always, and just occasionally an American assassin ends up with the attempted killer surviving. In the video today, we're looking at 10 assassins who have survived for so long now that you'll probably be surprised to learn that they're not dead from old age. Number 10. Sahan Sahan the 1960s were a terrible decade to have the surname Kennedy. After JFK was gunned down in Dallas in 1963, Democrat hopes were pinned on his brother Bobby. Fast forward five years from John's death, and Bobby Kennedy was also gunned down, only moments after becoming the Democratic Party's top pick to run for president. His assassin, Sirhan Sirhan, was a Palestinian native born in Jerusalem. As the life bled out of yet another Kennedy, he was heard to shout, I did it for my country. Sirhan's guilt was pretty well established. Even the conspiracy theorists think that he fired at RFK. They disagree on whether there was a second shooter, though. Although Sirhan later claimed he couldn't remember a thing about the killing, prosecutors treated it as an open and shut case. On the 23rd of April 1969, the Palestinian assassin was given the death penalty. So you might be wondering, why is he still alive? Well, for that, you can thank the state of California. California outlawed the death penalty in 1972 before they had a chance to execute Sirhan. When it was reinstated a year later, all of those who had previously been sentenced to death, including Sirhan and one Charles Manson, were now on life imprisonment. Nearly 50 years after he was incarcerated, Sirhan is still hoping to be released. Number 9. John Hinckley Jr. On March 31, 1981, President Ronald Reagan stepped out of the Hilton Hotel in Washington, D.C. and into a hail of bullets. In a matter of seconds, John Hinckley Jr. squeezed off six shots, wounding two officers and putting a bullet through the press secretary's brain. The president himself was badly wounded, a slightly different angle, and Reagan would have been known as the fifth White House incumbent to be gunned down. So what happened to the man who nearly killed four people? Where is Hinckley now? Well, the answer is he's living in Virginia with his mother. After the shooting, Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity and committed to an asylum. This angered a lot of people, both because Hinckley had just committed what is usually a serious crime and because he was a spoiled rich kid who had never yet had to deal with the consequences of his actions. Things didn't improve much in the hospital. Hinckley was discovered to be exchanging letters with Ted Bundy and trying to contact Charles Manson. Hinckley was eventually released in 2016. At the time of writing, he was still confined to a 50-mile radius around his mother's home, and he is receiving psychiatric treatment. Number 8. Squeaky From If the name Squeaky From sounds like a kid's cartoon character, the actual personality of its owner couldn't be any more different. Born Lynette Squeaky, she was a member of the Manson family. Although she wasn't involved in the killing of Sharon Tate, the young dancer was obsessed by the cult leader. When Manson was moved between jails after his conviction, she moved town to follow him. She had other equally shady connections as well. Not long after Manson was imprisoned, Squeaky was arrested for the brutal murder of a couple. Again, she avoided jail, while again her associates, this time members of the Aryan Brotherhood, were imprisoned for the crimes. But even her connections with California's weirdest cult and a bunch of neo-Nazis had nothing on the time she tried to kill a U.S. president. The year was 1975, and it was a warm day in Sacramento. As Gerald Ford passed through a crowd, Squeaky suddenly emerged from between two people, pulled out a loaded gun, and pointed it right at the president's chest. But the gun, it jammed. It didn't go off, was Squeaky's defense when she was arrested, and it sure as heck did not fly. She was jailed for attempted assassination and only released in 2009. She currently resides in New York City. Interestingly, though, she wasn't the only young woman to try and kill Ford. Number 7. Sarah Jane Moore Sarah Jane Moore looks like the world's least offensive grandma. Well, never has the truism, don't judge a book by its cover, ever been truer. Only 17 days after Squeaky's lame attempt to off Ford, Sarah Jane Moore similarly raised a gun in San Francisco to the president and fired at his head. Her lone bullet missed his skull by mere inches. 
Perhaps weirdest of all about Moore is how boring her life was up to that point. While Squeaky was the kind of girl whose life choices were always going to boil down to assassinate a president or drink the Kool-Aid, Moore was unbelievably average. She'd been married, she worked as a bookkeeper, she enjoyed amateur acting, and in a CNN interview, she said the only trouble she'd previously been in was for jaywalking. The only sign that she was an up-and-coming fruitcake was her association with the Symbionese Liberation Army, the left-wing radical cell that kidnapped Patty Hearst. And what's even crazier than Moore's really boring life? Well, now the fact that she's sort of a minor celebrity, appearing on news programs to discuss the time she almost killed a president. Number 6. Thomas Hagen You don't know the name Thomas Hagen, but you've certainly heard of his victim. Hagen was the guy who killed Malcolm X, shooting the civil rights leader dead while he addressed the Organization of Afro-American Unity in 1965. At least, he was the only guy who admitted to the killing. Up to three others were involved, possibly with the backing of Malcolm X's old organization, Nation of Islam, who had recently fallen out with. Interestingly, while two others went to jail alongside Hagen, no one seems to know for sure if they were even at the scene of the crime. For Hagen's part, he has repeatedly said that he wishes he hadn't shot X, once stating, I don't think it should have ever have happened. At the time, he certainly felt differently. Hagen justified the shooting by saying Malcolm X had slandered Nation of Islam's leader and that his leaving had threatened to destroy the organization. The crowd who watched him shoot X evidently didn't care. They beat Hagen half to death before the police intervened. Today, Hagen is a family man with a full-time job, living outside prison on parole. Prior to that, he was on release Monday to Friday, only serving weekends in jail. Number 5. Arthur Bremer you probably know George Wallace for his Segregation Now, Segregation Forever speech, but the Alabama governor was nearly so much more. In 1972, he was favorite to win Maryland in the Democratic primaries to run for president. He'd already won Michigan, stretching his support outside of the Deep South. He might even have become the first Democratic nominee from the party's Dixocrat wing. Might is the operative word here, though. We'll never know, because on the day before the Maryland primary, Arthur Bremer stepped out of a crowd and shot Wallace in the abdomen. He shot the governor because his plan to kill Nixon had fallen through when he saw how well guarded the president was and decided to set his sights a little lower. In videos of the event, he can be seen in the crowd with an eerie grin on his face, his eyes obscured by sunglasses. Wallace survived the assassination attempt, which left him paralyzed from the waist down. Bremer was jailed despite claiming to be schizophrenic and kept inside for 35 years. Released in 2007, he is now said to have a steady job. Conditions of his parole, however, mean that he cannot go anywhere near elected officials. Number 4. Francisco Martin Duran Francisco Martin Duran's attempt to kill Bill Clinton has to be one of the most ham-fisted assassination attempts in history. Duran hid an assault rifle in his trench coat and took it up to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and waited until he saw the president emerge from the White House. He immediately began firing across the lawn, cracking a window, and that's it. Duran's firing was super erratic and lasted only a couple of seconds before bystanders managed to wrestle him to the ground. It was later revealed that the man he thought was Clinton wasn't Clinton at all, in fact Clinton was inside watching TV. Not a single person was hurt during the attempt. Duran later claims that he'd been fighting aliens, which briefly turned his bungled assassination attempt into a nationwide source of amusement. As excuses went, though, it was even weaker than Squeaky's insistence that failing to accurately load a gun means you can't have been trying to kill someone. Duran was convicted in 1995 after 60 witnesses were gathered who said that he'd never mentioned aliens, but certainly had mentioned killing Clinton. Number 3. Kenneth McGriff McGriff is the odd one out on this list because he's the one person we don't know for absolute sure killed their target. A drug trafficker and gang member, McGriff was the kingpin of New York's Supreme Team, a fancy name for a gang of hoodlums who killed people over crack debts. He's currently in prison for hiring people to kill his enemies, but law enforcement thinks he was also one of the people behind the most notorious music assassinations of the 21st century, the killing of Run DMC member Jam Master Jay. Jay was killed in 2002 in Queens, New York City, while sat inside a recording studio. Two gunmen entered and shot him through the head. The murder remains officially unsolved, but McGriff is suspected of it. He's also suspected of a possibly related plot to kill 50 Cent, who Jay had mentored in the late 1990s before the young rapper was rediscovered by Eminem. In 2005, federal agents even released an affidavit they'd written in 2003 fingering McGriff for the two assassination attempts. In short, McGriff is a really bad dude and quite likely the shooter behind one of the most notorious hip-hop killings, not featuring Biggie or Tupac. However, as we said, this has never been definitively proven.
Number 2. Claudine Langer Winter sports fans of a certain age will remember Spider Savage, a skier from California who competed in the 1968 Winter Olympics for Team USA before going on to smash the cup circuit. But most of you probably remember him from how he died. In 1976, Spider was shot dead at his home in Aspen, Colorado. To this day, no one knows if it was an accident or a deliberate assassination. What everyone agrees to was that Claudine Langer was the one who shot him. A singer and actor once married to Andy Williams, Langer had interesting pedigree where shootings were concerned. She was close friends with Bobby Kennedy and was there when he was gunned down. At first, things seemed almost as clear-cut with her own killing. She was found standing over Spider's body with the murder weapon in her hands. Incredibly, she tried to claim she'd been showing her victim the gun when it accidentally went off. The case was a media sense. It soon came to revolve around whether Langer had been seeing Spider at the time, or whether they'd broken up after a brief fling and she had returned to kill him. Thanks to the police bungling the evidence, the judge had to go with the latter, and Langer was never convicted of murder. She still lives in the Aspen area, which is a twisted little detail we really don't want to think about too much. Number 1. Mark David Chapman after two entries clouded with uncertainty, it's grimly reassuring to report there are no such ambiguities with our last killer. Chapman is the guy who shot John Lennon dead for being famous. He wasn't a symbol of some ideas Chapman disagreed with. Lennon was simply the most famous man that Chapman could think of. And so it was that this overweight loser decided to kill him to make himself equally famous. And what's the worst part? But it kind of worked. On the 8th of December 1980, Chapman walked up to Lennon's Manhattan building. He saw the singer leaving and got him to autograph a copy of his latest album. As a result, we still have a photo of John Lennon and Mark Chapman standing together like a pair of friendly acquaintances. After Lennon left, Chapman then hung around for a few more hours before finally shooting the ex Beatle as he returned to the building just before midnight. Famously, Chapman didn't flee, instead, he just stood around reading Capture of the Rye. Today, the portly assassin is in his 60s and still resides in jail. It's also got to the point where denying Chapman parole has become something of a sport. It's a regularly played fixture, and it's got an easy-to-guess outcome. Indeed, it seems very unlikely he's ever going to be released. So I really hope you enjoyed that video, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel for brand new videos every single day. Also, I've got a podcast. It's called Brain Food, and it's educational, entertaining content just like this. It's a bit longer form, and it goes into a lot of depth on a specific subject, really getting into all of the fascinating little details. You can check out that podcast through a link in the description below, or just search your favorite podcast app for Brain Food. And if you like this YouTube channel, you are sure to love that podcast. But if you want to watch something else right now, why not check out a related video from the Top 10's archives over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.